Hi, everyone. It's one o'clock on the dot, but I'm not sure that Lori has joined who I would normally, who I would turn to for kicking us off, but maybe I just can't see. Lori, are you here? Um, Carrie, how would you like to handle? You want to give Lori a few minutes or do you want to just get us started? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, well, I, I do, I did correspond with her yesterday and she should be here. Um, I can wing it if we want to get started. Um, and, and, and then if she shows up, we can uh, go from there. Okay, sounds great. Okay, so um, since I'm winging it, I actually don't have the uh, the the roll call prepared to do. Um, oh, thank you. Um, great. So th thanks. Welcome today. Um, I know that today we were originally supposed to. Um, go over a lot of different topics, but we um, are gonna cut the meeting down because our speakers couldn't come up, come today to meet with us. Um, but let's do the roll call. So we have Christy Brigham. Present. John Calloway. I'm here. Uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel. I'll hopefully he'll join us later. Um, Matt Holmes. Okay. Um, Will Horwath. I am aware that Will is going to attend remotely um, since I did confirm that with him. Um, after we do roll call, I'll shoot him a text to see if he's having trouble getting in. Um, Lara Cooper's. Present. Connor McGee. Davy. I'm here. Okay, great. Davy's here. Mark. I'm here. And Melissa. Okay, Lori. Are you here? No, yet? I'm sorry. I was sitting in on the uh, November. Um, link for some reason that's what popped up in my um, in my uh, feed so I apologize but I'm here and I'm happy to take over if you'd like. Great that'd be great and I'll just do the last one Marion. Uh, Marion and I'm here. Okay sorry about the pronunciation. Okay great so Lori's here I'm going to pass you the baton. Okay I'll, I'll take that baton. Um, Will and uh, Will Horwath also joined us, so we, okay, we should record also, that. I was okay. also in that November link. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, that's what, just for you folks over in uh, CNRA, that's what popped up in the in, uh, notifications. And so I had to go back. So I don't know if there's something that in the future we can troubleshoot why that happened. But anyhow. Oh, yeah, this is Nathaniel. Uh, I'm also I, I'm great. joined after roll. Okay, great. Um, so having missed the initiation of uh, the agenda, um, I apologize uh, with that. But I do want to thank everybody for taking the time to be in on this and um, I laud the uh, courage and uh, tolerance of those who made it all the way to Sacramento in the heat. And I appreciate in particular <laughs> that that's not easy to do right now. But it <laughs> underscores the value of our work. Also, Lori, we didn't go through the um, content of the agenda in detail. I just jumped into the role. So. OK, great. Um, well, with that uh, flag, um, as folks will see in the agenda, we have had to postpone the discussion on remote sensing for nature-based solutions, and we're looking to incorporate that into September, along with uh, focus on our forest work. 
uh, in particular relative to the modeling. So uh, we apologize that we didn't know uh, that our speakers would not be available until very late, and so we could not let other folks know in advance. As a result, this will be a somewhat shorter meeting for everybody. And I appreciate for those online or for uh, anybody who has come into the uh, meeting in Sacramento uh, that it will be shorter than longer on this. Um, so this meeting is really going to hone in on uh, the targets that the administration has promulgated. And um, we want to better understand um, how these targets were arrived at um, in, in Toto. And then um, the prioritization that you may envision within them, kind of the sequencing that you may be thinking about for impact, and then barriers to implementation. And our goal within this is to engage the committee in that conversation about the thinking for prioritization and implementation and how we can best address barriers uh, to implementation. Some of these items were identified in the uh, committee's report at the end of last year, but um, it's an opportunity to both rethink those and bring those forward in a, in a more focused fashion. I think the other aspect that we're, um, we want everybody to be aware of is that the bond, the $10 billion bond for climate uh, has been approved for the November agenda, and that can be an important pathway to helping in implementation. So that's something to keep in mind as we are moving forward here um, in this in this time frame and towards these objectives. So I would like to invite the state, uh, whether that is Amanda or Klesi, and Klesi, I understand you have COVID, I'm so sorry. Uh, you have joined a, a horde of people that I'm now aware of that have, have uh, COVID, so I hope it uh, gets over quickly. But I'd like to invite the state to walk us through uh, their thinking on the targets, and as I say, with particular goals of wanting to discuss prioritization, uh, sequencing, and uh, then barriers. Uh well, Lori, I think uh, I gave a very thorough presentation in the last committee meeting, walking mm -hmm. through targets and sort of what our considerations were, um, uh, and you know, sort of multiple uh, elements of our approach. And I, I'm, I think we teed this meeting up with the express sort of understanding that the committee, this would be a great time for the committee to come, sort of after having heard the presentation and after looking at the, the targets kind of okay now what kinds of questions might you have or or comments feedback um you know we welcome that um we also flagged that we would be very grateful for any sort of heads up on specific questions people might have by july 1 just so that we could um be prepared for those i think that might have been actually in a communication with you um, I'm not sure if it was actually expressed to the committee. I think we flagged like an earlier heads up would be helpful on things, but in any case, we will be as responsive as we can to any questions and feedback that you have. And if there's something that folks want to dig in on that none of us have the expertise um, or haven't like dug deeply into the to the numbers and data recently, then we can get back with answers to those things. Cool. Let me, hi, um, hi. Let me just shut off this so I'm. Um, I think that was uh, somebody just going on to, to mute uh, with that. So, Amanda, just to clarify, when we had our conversation, I thought that the state was going to do a brief synopsis of what it had presented last time to tee things up. Um, from my perspective, the only uh, questions that I have heard are around the prioritization uh, and sequencing for impact uh, and how the state is thinking about that. But I did believe that we were having a brief synopsis. I don't know because you you uh, have some slides around that. I mean, I, I'd be happy to hear the presentation again. Well, let me ask the committee members writ large. Uh, would it be useful to have a quick run through of that a second go round?
Maybe this is Laura. I, yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say I'm OK either way. I have some mm -hmm. notes with questions. Um, from the target document and from what was presented last time, but didn't send any se send anything in advance. So I apologize for that. Will, were you going to say something there? I, I just said maybe just a two or three minute. Um, lightning talk. <laughs> summary. Yeah, I, I appreciate also... the lightning so summary. But, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, uh, this is Carrie. Um, thank you for this um, part of the discussion, Amanda. Um, I think that I'm, I'm noticing, I know last time we had several people who were out, and I realized that um, we likely should, all, we probably also looked at the recording of last week, but just in case, I know that Mark and a few other people were unable to attend. Um, I guess I, I would also appreciate having just a, a revamp again, um, if, even if it's if it's less detailed. I was one of the people who missed last time as well, so um, <laughs> and I haven't had time to review. So um, if there's time in the agenda for a little bit of a recap, that would be great for me. I'm not going to do a recap. I'll just go over the presentation again. Okay. So, well, Amanda, that's very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. OK, so. We released the nature based solution targets on April 22nd of this year. And our approach to doing this really was focused on. You know, understanding that creating durable carbon sinks on our on lands in California really requires that they that we have healthy and resilient lands in California. So. Our North Star in many of these targets is to increase the health and resilience of our lands, uh, which sort of unlocks their ability to serve as, as carbon sinks. Um, we base these targets on best available science, and I encourage everyone to the extent that you're interested and open to take a look at the methodology document that we released alongside of the targets where we explain like, how did we come up with this number and what were our assumptions and um, I think I encourage this both because I think it's uh, you know helpful to understand the targets themselves but also and particularly because I think if there are flags with our approach our methodology we would love to hear them um, in some cases I'm sure you know we will need to make adjustments and in other cases I'm sure we will be able to explain why our, our approach still sort of makes the most sense to us so um, that's the second big, big piece of our approach here is best available science. And then, you know, our goal really was to meet or exceed the carbon stock target for lands in the scoping plan and to support implementation of the state's climate adaptation strategy. Next slide. So how did what how did we do? How do we think about calculations? We came up with the targets. Um, we considered things like how our lands currently managed and what are the, the known associated carbon implications of that management. Um, what are some of the most effective nature-based solutions uh, that we can really uh, make sure are front and center here? And then from a sort of technical perspective and a practical feasibility, you know, what's possible. Um, and we also considered our ability to, to measure and track progress over time. Next slide. So there's two slides here that um, lay out the cumulative totals for what these targets are calling for um, by 2045. And I won't read them all, but the reason we wanted to share the information this way is that I'm about to go through the land type specific targets. And it's, I think, helpful, at least for me anyway, to see what, what do they all roll up to? What are we talking about between now and 2045? What are the totals? So maybe um, Chelsea can go to the next slide and people can just take a minute to look at those totals. And we can move on. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through some of the targets. This presentation does not actually include or highlight all of the targets. We did this sort of as, a, as an overview, so please do look at the document for um, the complete picture. But 
I'll tick through the eight landscape types here and some illustrative targets for each. So forests, um, again, we define this as land with 10% or more live tree canopy cover. Um, and that you know, our, our latest calculations uh, show that these, these land, this land type covers 27% of the state or 28.7 million acres, next slide. And some illustrative examples for our targets on uh, in forests, we have multiple different sort of buckets of nature-based solution actions and some very specific uh, practices uh, that are outlined under under underneath each of those buckets. And as you can see, also we lay out targets for. 2030, 2038, and 2045, because this is what was um, outlined in AB 1757. Next slide. Shrublands and chaparral. This is land that has 10% or more shrub or chaparral canopy cover. And these lands, this landscape type covers 32.9% of the state, so a big chunk. Next slide. And again, you can see sort of broad buckets, but some very specific um, activities and practices, nature-based solutions um, laid out for each of the three target years. And I hope that, you know, I've said this before, but I'll just say it again. Um, you know, we work very hard to build the recommendations of this group into these targets. And so we're we're hoping that you see yourselves in these specific practices and areas of focus. Um, and at, you know, at the end of the targets as an appendix, I believe we included um, what we call a targets alignment table, sort of what is it that the uh, committee recommended? Where is it that the state landed? How do these things kind of align or not align? Um, so I just wanted to sort of put that on everyone's radar. Next slide. Grasslands. Um, these are 9.7 million acres approximately, or 9% of the state. Next slide. Um, again, we've, we've got our very clear sort of structure of you know, big bucket conservation and restoration, but then the, the very specific practices and numbers across all three target years. Next slide. So I just laid out forests, shrubland, chaparral, and grasslands, and then we have another bucket of nature-based solution targets that were uh, focused on wildfire risk reduction. And these targets that I'm about to walk through um, cover all three of those landscape types. So that's why you can see them all here on the slide and the flag that this across the next set of, of targets, um, you know, the, the baseline is 71.3 million acres. Of, 67% of the state. Next slide. So our wildfire risk reduction targets are laid out here. Um, key takeaway is that across all three target years, we are calling for greater levels of beneficial fire practices um, that get us to 2.5 million acres annually in 2045. Next slide. Croplands. We have 9.5 million acres of croplands in California. Um, next slide. And the illustrative uh, examples of, of targets are laid out here with specific, you know, healthy soils practices. Um, we also included on this slide, just because there was room, um, an example of a non-acre-based target that uh, was put forward for California's croplands related to converting conventional systems to organic systems. Um, this is a percentage based target. Next slide. Develop plan. So communities, you know, along our infrastructure, 6.8 million acres. Um, next slide. So this is um, a suite of practices, nature based solutions that we're, we've developed targets for. Next slide. There are actually additional. Oh, oh just kidding. I thought there was another slide. <laughs> Um, there are more targets in this space as there are for many of, um, of these landscape types. Um, okay, next slide. Wetlands and seagrasses, so about 2% of the state. And next slide, uh, a suite of uh, conservation, restoration, and protection of 
ecosystems from sea level rise targets. And just want to kind of flag on this slide that we um, really we, we really wanted to reflect the diversity of California's wetlands in these targets. So um, you know, really did our best to try to be as comprehensive as we could. Next slide. Sparsely vegetated lands. Okay, these uh, beaches, dunes, um, any part of the state that has less than 10% of vegetation cover. So this, this is um, a, a lot of different kinds of landscapes fall into this category. Um, next slide. Sparsely vegetated lands targets are laid out here. Um, I, I would just flag that, you know, I think there's, um, we had a lot of opportunity through this process to build out targets that reflect uh, practices and, and nature-based solutions that we know deliver climate benefits that our partners at CARB were less able to consider given the constraints that they operate within when they're pulling together the scoping plan. So um, that is another reason why you see a set of 81 nature-based solution targets um, that are not necessarily reflective of the practices that are called for in the scoping plans because we didn't have the constraints that they do regarding modeling and economic analysis, et cetera. Um, next slide. So, you know, next steps, I think, is probably a better way to kind of talk about, talk about or wrap up this little presentation is just to say, we are required to report on our progress toward meeting these targets every two years. And that means that we're going to need to really amp up our efforts to, number one, to track climate action on California's lands. Number two, measure the impact of those actions. And then, of course, number three, be able to report on our progress. So. Um, you know, we're going to measure our progress sort of initially through regularly inventorying carbon stocks on our lands using um, CARB's Natural Working Lands Carbon Inventory. We're going to do a lot of work to understand how we can do better on tracking. And uh, we will utilize CARB's forthcoming standard methods to track nature-based solution climate action um, per AB 1757. And as I'm looking at you, is there anything else? I think that kind of covers the, the biggies. Okay, yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Great. And I think that's it unless, oh, okay, great. Sorry. One last slide here on alignment. Um, I mentioned that we, we built out a table to showcase as easily as we could kind of a comparison of what was put forward by this committee and what was put forward by the state and how these uh, proposed uh, or sets of targets align or don't. So um, 47 out of the 81 of our targets broadly align with or exceed those from the committee. The ones that are not included in that number, so the 34 uh, outstanding, really they just don't have a corresponding year from the committee. So um, it was hard for us to do like an assessment of that. And then there were seven targets that um, this committee put forward that uh, really did not align with the scope of our approach to the target. So we were really putting things forward in terms of quantitative numbers, uh, percentages, number of trees, number of acres, et cetera, things that we can quantitatively measure. Um, and so some of these targets around things like funding or research, planning or carbon, those um, just were not within the scope of the way that we approached the target. So wanted to share our assessment here um, and welcome discussion on that piece, of course. Is there anything else? No, I can't remember. Oh, there's more. Oh, yes. OK, so a couple, couple things. Um, the committee recommended avoid, avoided conversion targets. And we're happy to go into details here, but we set conservation targets. Um, some of the EAC recommendations were very, very specific about sort of specific species or like a specific grant program or a specific location. And our, our targets were intentionally very broad and aspatial. 
So in some ways, that was um, a place where we didn't have great alignment. Um, and then there was a couple of cases where the EAC made references for alignment with 30 by 30. And you know these efforts absolutely have overlap, but it's not one to one per se. Um, and I, or again, happy to go into more detail on that if helpful. Next slide. Now I don't know what's coming. I was prepared to this question. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I think you know just wanted to flag that we did have some questions that were identified through. Um, the interagency review of the recommendations that you all put forward for each of the of the land types. Um, and I will just say that if that is something that you all are willing and ready and interested in sort of uh, providing some some uh, thoughts on, we would welcome hearing hearing answers to those. But I'm also very cognizant of the fact that um, no, this is time for you to ask questions of us or provide feedback of us. And so just wanted to remind everyone of this um, in case uh, helpful for discussion or anything else. I don't think so. Okay. All right. And so maybe we can go back to, yeah. So that's my, my. Well, Amanda, <laughs> that was terrific. Thank you so much for uh, doing the um, speed dating approach to uh, this. Um, so appreciate it. Um, I do want to note that Matt Holmes has also joined uh, the discussion. Uh, so I want to just acknowledge that he is there. And I think, therefore, we only have two committee members uh, who may not be present. Uh, and if I've missed them, the two that I have that I do not see are Mark Schwartz and Connor McGee. Is that correct? Okay. No, no, I'm here. Mark is here. Okay, apologies. No, um, is Melissa then? So it's sorry, I marked that wrong. Um, thanks. Okay. Yeah, Melissa isn't here. Melissa said she couldn't come. Right, you're correct. I remember that now. Um, so I suspect there are quite a few questions, and I'm happy to at the end go to some of the questions that you flagged that I know I may have some answers to in terms of agency questions, uh, Amanda. So why don't we save that to the end and look at our timing at that point and see how others uh, can look at that as well. Um, but why don't I open it to the committee? And for those of us who are on uh, the hybrid, who are on Teams, is it possible to take down the agenda item so that we can see each other a little bit better oh, the, yeah. on the screen share? Um, thank you um, with that. So why don't I open it uh, to committee for questions because I know I certainly uh, have a have some of them, but why don't I open it to others and uh, we'll we'll circulate through that. I know Laura, you had flagged you had some as well. Yeah, I'm happy to start because it's it's something that um, Amanda just referenced, which was this, distinction between avoided conversion and conservation. Um, and so, yeah, I was just hoping you could say a little bit more about that decision um, to focus on conservation, especially given the, um, the sort of broad characterization of conservation in the document. Um, I guess I'm just not quite sure what conservation means in this um, yeah. In, in this context. So I'd like to understand more precisely what conservation means to you all. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I will start, but I welcome, first of all, maybe Clusty, I don't know if you could go into the FAQ and pull, we had a question, we, we pulled together an FAQ document with as many questions as we thought people were likely to ask. It's kind of misleading to put an FAQ together before anyone's asked a question at all. But they, uh, essentially, you know, what, what do we expect people to like need to know to understand you know how to assess these targets. So just I should have flagged that too, and plus you can pull pull the info in there. Um, so let me try to answer, but turn to my partners for assistance here. I think first and foremost, what does conservation mean here? It means some form of durable protection without a super explicit, you know, this counts, this counts, this counts, that doesn't count, that doesn't count, that doesn't count. Um, and uh, I don't know, Clessy, if you were able to drop it in, but we go through pretty extensively, you know, why is it, here we go, she put it in, why is it that we chose conservation 
is avoided conversion. Um, and I'll just tick through. First, is it's very hard to track avoided conversion. Um, it's very hard to do that in a way that makes basically that involves making assumptions about um, where and when conversion would have occurred without an action. Um, and it also sort of suggests that land use today is like the A number one, exactly what it should always be and it should never, never change. Um, but Adam, maybe I'll look at Yeah, so, right. So with all of these targets, um, we had to think about can we track progress towards these targets? Because there's no point in setting a target that you cannot track progress towards. So avoided conversion is, is not real necessarily. So that is to say you can't prove that some plot of land um, was avoided um, because you can, you know, you could conserve something or whatever, but you can't guarantee that that would have been uh, developed given the absence of some policy or something. So we'll have like, we'll set a lot of policies and hopefully that leads to like infill and better land management and, you know, better planning, but we can never prove that one acre of land was avoided from being converted. But we can show that something has been conserved given a definition. So that's why we set conservation targets because we can track progress towards that, but we cannot track progress towards a hypothetical avoided conversion uh, number. So that's why we went with conservation, not avoided conversion. Um, and then also with the uh, like no net loss uh, numbers, <clears throat> you know, so with no net loss, that assumes that today's land use map, is the perfect land use map and that there should never be a change in the numbers that we have of any specific land type. And so we can't, we cannot guarantee that. Um, and I don't think anyone could necessarily argue that either scientifically or economically. And so we couldn't set no, no net loss targets necessarily also, because we know that certain things will need to be converted. Um, and so some of our targets, right, like even like oak woodland restoration, that's, that would be taking potentially agricultural land, like that's, you know, maybe uh, low productivity range land, putting that back into oak woodlands, right? So that would maybe decrease agricultural lands or even wetland restoration, right? So that would, could take away agricultural land, but we want that, um, that wetland restoration. So we couldn't set no net loss targets for, for those reasons. Yeah. And I would also flag um, that different sections of the report from the committee actually utilize the conservation target approach as well, Laura. Um, others like in deserts were for a, a, a no, no further conversion, but I completely understand where uh, the state is coming from on this because conservation is something that you can take an action and you can track that action. So that makes sense. Uh, are there other questions around that definitional approach? Uh, Laura, did you have a couple of other questions or should we look to other folks? Um, I do, but I'm happy to look to other folks. Got my first one in. Okay. <laughs> Well, you broke the ice, so we're very appreciative of that. Um, are there other committee members? I apologize. I cannot see the entire group of people. Debbie has a question, so uh, we'll go to Debbie. And since I cannot see everybody, I'll keep scrolling through, but we'll start with Debbie. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so my question, my original question was the exact same as Laura's. So thank you for asking that. And then thank you for the discussion, everyone on that. And so I haven't read the um, kind of the report yet or the FAQs yet or anything. Um, so this, my question may be answered in there, but I guess from the um, the perspective of avoided conversion, to me, that concept kind of acknowledges value in, you know, land 
the way it is. So whether it's grasslands or shrublands or deserts, there's value in those that are currently there, you know, being that way. And I, I hear what you're saying about not being able to kind of track that as a goal, but I'm wondering if there uh, is some discussion about, you know, recognizing the value in the lands not being converted, even though that's not something that we are going to be able to, you know, track um, with numbers. Just wondering if there's some kind of acknowledgement of value and non-conversion, even though that's something that is not going to be one of the targets. I think part of the um, document, actually a big portion of the document is talking about all of the different landscape types and all of the benefits that they provide um, both in terms of climate, of course, benefits, but also co-benefits and the, the benefits they provide to society and communities, and public health and all of those things. And so I think implicit in that whole discussion, framing up these targets is demonstrating the value of having these lands. And, you know, I mean, the targets are all about conserving, restoring, uh, you know, and generally improving the health and resilience of these ecosystems. So I think that's sort of implicit or inherent in this, this document. Yeah, Debbie, I'll just add to that. I agree with Adam, but also just want to flag, we view the targets not so much as the space where we get into kind of um, like the details about each landscape type and what value, what values they provide from you know, a climate perspective. Um, we do that in the, the, the climate smart land strategy. So each, that's, that is where we have like, you know, entire sections dedicated to, um, you know, what are the benefits? And of course, we're looking at this from a climate perspective and that strategy. And so it's not to suggest that there aren't many benefits um, that these lands provide, but um, we do try to make it very clear in that strategy, exactly what you just sort of outlined, that these 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 lands and the the their function and their health and their uniqueness is what we are aiming to protect and uh, and increase respect for through the target. So I see the targets as like this is the action that we're calling for, and the strategy is the why. Why are we calling for that action? So hopefully um, you can find what you're looking for in the strategy, but I would encourage you to please, when we do put the draft out, if you see an opportunity for us to, to highlight that more, more, to let us know. Well, Thanks very much. Uh, one, one thought there, and I do want to flag, there'll be John and then Mark, um, is that in the Climate Smart Land Strategy uh, updating, I think something that may capture some of what Debbie is talking about is to some degree there is a base assumption of what our lands do. That's what they're doing currently. And so as we convert these to whether it's built, and I think that's often the uh, target in avoided conversion is uh, avoiding the conversion of something to a built uh, environment or to from a relatively natural state to a non-relatively natural state, that as we as those things occur, the services for climate adaptation and for carbon sequestration are generally concomitantly reduced. Um, so that whereas these targets are what we want to proactively do, and that's what the targets are about, uh, that the state has put out. Um, the Climate Smart Land Strategy perhaps can have, can incorporate uh, this other point um, that flags that what we currently rely on uh, is, what did they say about the stock market? Past performance is no indication of future returns. Um, if you're going to change your portfolio, um, you know, you can't really decide, you can't plan exactly what's going to happen out of that. So I just make that as a suggestion. Um, with that, John, and then after John would be Mark, and after Mark would be Carrie. Great. So uh, my question is about um, the way you approach the timing or the prioritization of of actions over, you know, from now until um, 2040. And um, I understand, you know, definitely the default was to have a standard, you know, sort of if a 
standard rate across the whole time. But I think there are and on, there's a few that that aren't that where there's some variation over the different time the intervals, and um, there are some that are standard that I think probably should are 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 more likely to be variable. And I, of course, I looked at the wetland ones in most detail, and you know, like the the sea level rise protection ones, sea, those are going to become much more important later on as sea level rise starts to become higher and there's more opportunities for migration. So it seems like those are likely to occur, occur in the later intervals. Um, and then across the different habitat types, um, different ones are more, have much, are, are sort of more mature in terms of the the science and the knowledge around restoration. So it seems like the the some of those might be more front loaded, like the coastal wetlands are the ones where there's really immediate opportunities and a lot of sort of definitely low hanging fruit. And I think we highlighted in our recommendations like the seagrasses, the seaweeds, the montane meadows are ones where we, we may need to do more work up front and those may be not front loaded, but maybe more, there may be more opportunities down the road as we as we improve knowledge so that that's just one um comment and i you know i like i said i i totally understand that uh, taking a constant approach is 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 the default but i think some of those might there might be some nuances to adjust in some of those um could i add a comment to this it is a question uh, for for the state because the wet meadows was one where I saw a much higher target for restoration than for conservation. And I um, wanted to ask for clarification. When those wet meadows are on public lands, and my assumption is that this covered both public and private lands, perhaps there was no need for a conservation target. It was a restoration target, and then the land would be remaining as wet meadows because it's within the public lands context. But in another, uh, if that was not the case, I wanted to better understand why the target for conservation was so much lower than the target for restoration, given that once these systems are restored to a more functional state, uh, my assumption is that we would want to keep them that way. So um, if you could treat both John's point and, and mine together, I'd really appreciate that. Okay, well, that's a perfect example of a question that would have been super helpful to get in advance because we definitely are not prepared to speak to the methodology behind that particular one um, on the fly. So noted, Lori, and we can follow up with you um, on the specifics of why more restoration than conservation. Um, and then, John, it sounded like you had sort of two points, the first being um, is there a prioritization across these targets? Is there any prioritization? And then number two, um, you know, why did we take, in some cases, an approach of a constant over annually versus others where we had adjust, we did not take that approach. So I'm gonna try to split this baby and I'll answer the first one and then hand it off to Adam on the second. But to say, no, there we did not include any prioritization across these targets. Um, you know, they all provide benefits for California. And so we're not going, we just, that was not our preferred approach. Um, and on the question of uh, the, you know, consistent increases over time versus big jumps, I'll just say, um, you know, all of those involved conversations with uh, the folks across our agencies here and, and many others who are not here today, um, to understand some assumptions about how that how those practices may or may not accelerate over time. So, Adam, if you want to add any color to that, yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, kind of the the thought process that went into most every target is is thinking about you know what is the overall need um, in the state you know through time and uh, by 2045. And then, um, and then it's thinking about, okay, how do we divvy that up annually uh, to actually generate these annual targets that we have to set? And I got to say, you know, there's no perfect way, right? There's no right answer on how you divvy these things up. I mean, I would almost argue, uh, to John's point, 
we would want to front load things because you don't want to be scrambling at the end to do all of your sea level rise protection when the sea is already at your front door. You know, you want to do it at the, the front. So, I mean, you could you could argue it in a million different ways. And so uh, a few of these, you know, are responsive to um, other actions uh, we take. So, for example, there is the um, uh, post fire restoration targets and those go up and then they go down. And that's because we should see a response from all of our fuel reduction and beneficial fire activities. So we should have less need for that in the future because hopefully we're doing all this work up front. Um, and so, yeah, some of these are more integrated with each other than uh, you know others. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of my response to how you divvy, divvy up the annual acreage. Sure. Um, so Adam, a point of clarification before we move to Mark and then Carrie and then Christy. Um, you said that uh, to some degree this was based on the state need, you know, the uh, acreage targets. And could you clarify, is that the state need for carbon sequestration for emissions reductions, or is that the state uh, need for adaptation, or, it, or is it combined? But I'm assuming, because you're the one leading on that, that that may be for the uh, emissions reductions of reduction in CO2? Oh, it's more like the ecological need. So okay. it's going, um, okay. yeah, it's more like the ecological need. So it's not just focused on carbon or, you know, the, the impacts that th these actions will have towards our carbon stock targets. And in fact, you know, a lot of these actions, we don't have the ability to estimate what the carbon impacts will be. That's the whole reason why we have these targets. It's because like in the scoping plan, we included everything that we could possibly model that there's sufficient science, sufficient models to figure out how does management and climate change impact these things into the future. But you know, there are so many actions that we know we need to take that we just can't model. And so we don't want to wait to take action until we can model them, right? We wanna start taking those actions and we will develop the models to assess these impacts as we go along. And so, yeah, with these, a lot of these targets, it's about what does the state need? To, what are these actions that we know we should be taking? Because we already went through a, a state public process, you know, with the first climate smart strategy to like get a, a list of actions that we know are ecologically and climate beneficial. And so it's like, now let's, let's put some numbers to those. And that's, that's what this is. And so, okay. Yeah. So if I'm understanding you, um, there was a, a suite of, and this is consonant with what the committee was working towards, which is climate uh, focused as opposed to carbon only. So subsuming, but not limited to carbon. Um, at some point, it would be very helpful to have a sense of internally, um, to the degree that you can, was this based on any hierarchy of need? Uh, water supply, urban sustainability, uh, food supply, because there, as, as you have rightly flagged, and I think we're all cognizant, there's a multitude of needs. So um, just at some point, having a better understanding of, of that would be helpful. Uh, well, I can't say that um, our objective is not to maximize carbon stocks or sequestration in natural and working lands. Our objective is to enhance the uh, resilience and health of ecosystems and communities in California. And then we will quantify the carbon consequence of that action. Right? So that's how we're looking at it. It's more like, what do we need to create healthy, resilient ecosystems and communities? And then we're going to quantify that carbon impact and that contribution to carbon neutrality, whether it's emissions or it sinks, you know, we'll figure that out. Well, this may be something that we revisit. I'm going to move on to you, Mark. That's actually, I, I think, a nice uh, segue there. Um, because I'll, <clears throat> I'm going to focus attention on the developed lands for a minute. And as we've discussed before, it's a relatively small fraction of land. And it's a relatively small 
pool of carbon, and we're talking about actions in the strategy that um, increase the acreage of uh, green space and trees, and that that will increase the amount of carbon stocks uh, on those systems. And the methodology and the strategy both talk about um, the, the planting and the, maybe the carbon benefits, but also the community benefits. And it seems to me that um, we're, we're kind of missing the elephant in the room there in a sense. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak to this and that the amount of carbon that we may gain from storing carbon in trees in de undeveloped lands, I'll we'll call that a teacup relative to carbon elsewhere, but the amount of carbon that we may avoid emitting as a consequence of using green space to reduce urban heat island effects might be the whole teapot. It seems like that's likely to be an impact of greater magnitude than the carbon storage. And uh, Adam, you just mentioned that, you know, we're looking at the total climate uh, carbon impact, not just sequestration, but also emissions. And it seems incumbent then that, that it would be to, to use the developed lands, uh, the programs there, and then measure, uh, is there an impact, an impact on heat island effects? Because there's a pretty good relationship between heat island effects, energy usage. I mean, one person estimates there's a hundred, that, you know, uh, heat island effects cost consumers $120 billion a, a year in excess uh, energy costs. And that it's something like 550 million tons of carbon across the contiguous United States. But uh, that's a lot of carbon. And it seems that, um, if we deploy these actions that are enhancing green space in urban environments, perhaps the bigger impact that's going to have is on avoided emissions than in carbon sequestration. And I don't see anything in here that really speaks to that issue of measuring that. Okay. Mark, I want to take one part of your question, but then maybe turn it to Adam on, on another, um, which is just to say that for each of these for each of these land types there the targets that we're setting are really aimed to support health and resilience we've said that a lot but so i forgive me for repeating myself but um you know there there is a carbon benefit to the the it, it, implementation of the targets that we're calling for there is also a resilience benefit and that's true for you know across the board and we're not going to pronounce on like you know exactly how much more for this one versus you know mitigation for sanitation benefit for either one we just know that there are lots of benefits and so i guess i'd say to you i think i agree with what you're saying in terms of uh you know perhaps there's a you know greater benefit to some of the targets for adaptation resilience than for our mitigation agenda um, but these targets are designed to deliver on both. So uh, I, I'm, I, I think I think we're in alignment on what you've just said about you know thinking about the most developed lands. But then Adam, I'll just start being if you want to speak to anything further. Yeah. So um, yeah, for sure, uh, you're totally right. Um, hopefully, we see more benefits from all of these actions than just the carbon benefits or just the ecosystem benefits. Um, so, yeah, the um, for example, the the energy use benefits from urban greening um, is something that's already on our radar, and we're thinking about how we can potentially quantify those things. That takes like super high resolution remote sensing to be able to do so. Um, that will be um, something into the future. Um, but that's because part of 1757 is not just quantifying the carbon and greenhouse gas benefits of these actions, but we're also mandated with quantifying co-benefits uh, co -benefits from these actions. And uh, you're right that the co-benefits from these expand beyond just, you know, whatever is within the, the vegetation themselves. Um, and so actually this is a good segue because actually there is a workshop that's going to be happening at 3 30 this afternoon about a contract that we're putting out i don't know if there's any people who want to work on a contract right now but about urban greening and the health impacts 
uh, from or the benefit the health benefits from from urban greening. And so our research division, I don't know, um, Matthias, can you maybe log in and then drop that link into the, uh, into the chat? Yeah. Into the chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So we'll drop the chat in. But uh, so that is to say, we're gonna we have a a, a contract right now uh, that's gonna that's gonna fly uh, to help quantify the the health benefits. Now, heat in and of itself also could be something that we just like um, consider as a co-benefit. Uh, uh, yeah, heat drawdown. Let's say uh, I feel like that's something we could also potentially monitor. Um, but then also just like the, the greenhouse gas benefits of decreased uh, heat, that is actually something we should already be able to capture in our other inventory because we have inventories on energy use. And so hopefully we should see yeah, that energy use go down as our tree canopy goes up. Um, so I'll just say one other thing, Mark, real quick is just a flag, kind of like my response to Debbie. Um, I would love for you to look at how we describe the various resilience benefits of these nature-based solutions on developed lands. Alongside the, the benefits for our mitigation agenda, we go into significant detail in that strategy. And so um, you know, that's a great place, again, to, to help us make sure we capture the, the, the full picture. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, so Adam, you mentioned you need very high resolution. And I, I think uh, imagery and I think that's that's true to be able to say uh, look at what is the effect of this schoolyard greening or the, this kind of tree planting uh, you know, on urban heat islands but I think as you also mentioned that you have um, already a data stream on energy usage and uh, it's probably not difficult to have a, a data stream on what is the magnitude of her heat island effects in the state of California. And so at, at, at a very coarse level, uh, you could be tracking through time whether uh, urban or developed lands and which uh, urban developed lands are getting better versus worse in terms of uh, urban heat island effects. And uh, so on a on a city by city scale, you could be looking more simply at um, the effect of programs on reducing uh, urban heat, it seems. Yeah, I'm not so not so sure about the spatial granularity we have on our energy use in our inventory. Um, I don't even think it's down to like cities necessarily, it's more like providers um yeah. and so uh, yeah i don't know but that's something we could potentially consider yeah it would take some thought yeah because i sort of feel like in the sense it's it's sort of like saying well you know we're, we had a plane that was going down and uh, we stabilized it and therefore the drinks done the trivial trays didn't spill oh and by the way the plane didn't crash i mean i feel like we're counting the carbon uh and not talking about uh, what might be the bigger impact which is the avoided emissions yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so yeah, well, first of all, I, I agree that like how people tend to quantify co-benefits or benefits in general of, of ecosystem, or that is to say nature-based solutions, undervalues the benefits of doing all of this climate action because it's typically like, oh, you got this benefit in this particular place where you've done the action doesn't take into account like the spatial, like you get benefits outside of where you've done the projects, for example, you know, mm -hmm. and also through time as well. Usually it's kind of like an immediate benefit and then that's it. And that's what you quantify and that's what you do. Anyway, uh, yeah, so some of these things are definitely on our mind already. And we're thinking through how, how do we better quantify the benefits of all these actions? Because that's how we'll actually get more resources to do more of this action is by quantifying these benefits fully. Um, and that's what we want to be able to do. So anyways, any any other ideas about like how to better quantify these actions? We're definitely open to hearing. So All right. thanks. Yeah. Um, Carrie. Thanks, Lori. So I have a question about the cropland section since um, I 
I'm going to try and tee it up here. So I've read through the um, methods for the scoping plan for croplands and looked at the modeling um, and understand that day scent is being used for annual crops. Um, and so therefore, there's an ability to predict nitrous oxide emissions based on um, different practices. And so I, I guess my question is, um, knowing that that's there in that scoping plan, but it's um, nitrogen management is not mentioned in the climate smart land strategy. To my knowledge, I may have missed it. Um, is it, maybe could you speak to the to the, the issue of or the the lack of mention of of nitrogen application to reducing emissions um, in agriculture and um, I am acknowledging that agriculture's main service is supporting our food security. So would instead of targeting um, a total reduction in fertilizer application, instead uh, proposing monitoring of the unit of food produ produced per unit of nitrogen applied? Um, I guess I, I I thought perhaps there would be a, a mention of that because that's one of the main sources of greenhouse gas emissions in in agriculture. And if you can't mention it right now because of a lack of quantitative information, how do we as scientists in the community uh, provide that to you more directly? Because I think there are instances in the literature that that show how to reduce the use of nitrogen fertilizer. And also, I know CDFA has FREP. Healthy soils, these other programs that are existing to support that effort. Yeah. Um, okay. So, if we're talking about manure management, that technically is not within our um, uh, boundaries. So, that is in uh, our what we call AB32 sector. So, that's like original climate bill. That, that's lumped in with uh, fossil fuels, dairies, landfills. Um, so manure management is, is outside of our purview. However, uh, once you use manure on the landscape, now it's like composting and fertilizer and stuff. Okay, so that gets, then it's back into our, um, our realm here. And so <clears throat> um, we do have actions uh, that should uh, better improve uh, our nitrogen use. Uh, we, we acknowledge actually in the scoping plan that especially in annual croplands, um, nitrous oxide emissions, like that's where, that's where the climate action is at. Like, yeah, there's soil carbon improving uh, with actions, but um, the nit nitrogen emissions by far kind of dictate uh, that the climate benefit um, of, of actions there. And so, we do include things like, you know, more compost uh, application to substitute for uh, synthetic fertilizer use. Also, we have these organic targets um, that are in there. Obviously, that's like a big, a big one. Um, and then in terms of uh, day set, you brought up day set. Uh, you know, we're looking to move beyond day set. So we have a, a contract, we're working with some contractors right now, developing new models that will be open source, um, that will better serve our needs um, for, for inventory purposes and um, future projection modeling. Um, in terms of descent and nitrous oxide emissions, I mean, we had a whole, you know, uh, committee meeting about descent, right, in DNDC. So I don't know that I want to go into it, but um, like it can't, you can't change the irrigation practice in day set, right? An irrigation method is a large driver of nitrous oxide emissions. And so we already know that day set doesn't meet our needs for being able to project or even quantify current nitrous oxide emissions. So anyway, there's just some thoughts there. Okay, and then, Lori, I see you're speaking. So no, go ahead. Um, I think, um, this is a question for another time. I'm just going to put it out there that, uh, well, since you're working with this new plan to develop open source models, will that roll your perennial crops into that as well? Or are you still going to rely on the allometric model? And if so, could we could we see it? Do you see the allometric model? Or do you want to see the open source model? Or what do you which what do you want to see? 
Well, I mean, you, I, yes, obviously, yes is the answer, implies, but what, what do you want? Sure, open source implies we'll see it, so so that'll be great. I guess if we're, it sounds like you're not going to be relying then on the models that are in the current scoping plan for the next iteration. So maybe I was just asking if you were going to, then could we see them? But it sounds like you're not, so it's a moot point. Yeah, so the, I mean, the allometric equations for um, orchards, that's in the um, Natural Working Lands Appendix of the scoping plan. So like those equations are just, they're there. Um, so that is that is what it is. But um, uh, yeah, uh, and are we going to do use um, this new modeling for orchards? That's the idea. I hope so. Um, so we'll see. It's We just kicked that off uh, last week. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Christy, and then Matt. Okay, I'm going to try and make this make sense. I have like four comments and then a question. So, I'll do the comments first. Um, the first comment is that <clears throat> I think the targets are really well done, and the report and the supporting methodology is also very well done and i only dug deep on forests and shrublands but because those were my groups but just appreciate the effort and i will say from my perspective the some of the gap in those two sections is that maybe the state is more willing to boss itself to a more rigorous standard than we were willing to boss you um as an advisory committee i mean there's other sources of disparity but i just wanted to call that one out um <clears throat> i appreciate the section at the end that has the other agencies and kind of how how all the agencies can work together and specifically under the cal epa section um number five about what are we going to do about air quality and um and regulation of air quality in order to meet our prescribed fire needs. I think that's hugely important and is a big impediment. So I really appreciate, and I know all the work that's going into that. So I appreciate that it's called out. And um, also number six under the Cal EPA about finding ways to track not only the impacts of management, but also climate. And then on this issue around co-benefits, um, <clears throat> this may be antithetical, although I think the state already does a really good job. Even the things that you can't quantify, like I get that this is all about the math and the models and the numbers. I think we are getting an understanding that facts don't change people's minds, but um, stories do and values based stories and being able to tell stories of actions implemented under this plan that benefit the Californians economically for biodiversity, for social justice and these other. So I just encourage you, Eve, as you move forward, and I, I didn't know that you were mandated to report on co-benefits, that's great. But even for the ones that you can't come up with the math for, like tell a good story because I, I've had, unfortunately, a lot of interactions with various people who, don't believe in climate change or are opposed to ways of addressing it. And as long as I Catherine Hayhoe them back to, we all want healthy forests, we all want a vibrant um, economics, and we all want people to be safe and secure, and we can get build a better world. So I just wanted to soapbox momentarily on that as a very important piece of this puzzle. Okay, now the weird question that's totally fine if they're. Um, isn't an answer uh in the reforestation piece i don't see a specific addressing of forests that may not be may not support forests under future climate or even current climate and i also and maybe it's in an appendix or something i didn't see it in the methods and um I don't, I know the state and the Forest Service are working on climate smart reforestation strategies, adjusting genetics and planting pallets. But I just wonder 
if that needs to be addressed a little bit more. And a piece, when I was thinking about it, I thought, well, maybe it's not in there because the goals only go to, what is it, 2038? Um, and there's that Davis et al. paper from 2023 that, sh that indicates that until mid-century, Fire, high severity fire will be more of a limiter than climate in terms of reestablishing for us. So I just a little, I worry for you that you'll get um, people uh, attacking the reforestation goals for not incorporating that. And I think it's okay to have strategies to work through it and to say, hey, you know, we see the d literature indicates that there's a window to establish these forests before climate gets too hot and we know we want it anyway. So I guess the, the question is, did you think about that part? Because um, there's that Stanford zombie forest paper, but there's also a lot of other paper anyway. So did you consider it? And do you have some stuff in your pocket to if anybody gets mad about that? Yeah. Um... So yeah, climate driven um, conversion and restoring after that. Um, no, that's not uh, something that was considered. Um, yeah, I guess that's the, the easy answer there. Christy, are, I just want to make sure I'm tracking because I think you've officially um, outbrained me here. But just to make sure, are you saying that there's no reference in the targets document to ensuring that when we're doing reforestation, we're using essentially like climate ready, um, you know, the right, that we're planting the right seeds for the future that we know is coming. Is that the question? It's too, that's part of it. And that's clearly a big piece of it. I, we, so I, we're doing a bunch of reforestation in the park service and we have gotten criticized that, um, and, and the forest service is trying to think through this, are you planting trees? Say you have a, a lot of forest that burned at high severity fire, right? So you've lost your forest canopy cover. One mm -hmm. of the considerations before reforestation is will that landscape even support forests of any kind in the future? So are you just wasting taxpayer time and money? And there is a little bit of controversy about that. And there's a lot of spatial scale variability. There is, a, I think it's a really good paper by Davis et al. 2023 that looks at climate as a constraint for growing a new forest versus high severity fire and lack of seed source. So um, that that's what I was, I was asking about both of those, both how you do the reforestation, is it climate smart in terms of where the genetics come from and the um, species composition? And also do you have a filter of like, well, this isn't going to be um, viable for forests in the future anyway. Okay. Well, uh, if I can just add to this, Adam, um, I think possibly even more than that is the reforestation pattern. And so what we're uh, clearly seeing is that how reforestation has been done historically, if you will, in the lines and pines approach, actually is fodder for fire. Whereas adopting a more naturalistic spatial patterning of reforestation, you know, the individual stands, clumps, and openings, or the ICOS uh, approach, is really a much more um, viable approach for disrupting the pattern of fire that is actually spread rather continuously by plantation approach. So I don't know that it belongs in these targets. It may be something more that is in the climate smart land strategy. But that um, species composition differentiation and spatial pattern differentiation have a huge impact on disrupting fire, the f flow of fire on the landscape. And the other piece that Christy is flagging is also really relevant to this strategy, which is there is a lot of controversy about where, where currently existing systems will persist or not. Um, but the largest impact on the on the landscape at present, and probably for a number of more decades for reestablishment, is fire. So um, I, let's could we address both of those things? 
Um, let me just say something at a high level, but then I'll kick it over to Adam. I just, I do want to say, um, you know, I think my sense, but please correct me if I'm wrong, because you are more experts than I, but um, my sense is that we're veering into a space where we talk about where it makes sense to do these solutions on lands. And I want to just pull us back to these targets are intentionally aspatial. And we're going to leave it up to the forest experts to do the kind of detailed analysis that Christy's talking about in terms of like, of all the forests that we have in California, is this the right place to do this particular nature-based solution? Like that's, that's really a very site specific and like expert driven uh, decision that we intentionally did not want the targets to be speaking to. So, um, that's my big picture comment. And then a, a tiny minor one, which is that Clessie did, um, I think just flag that we did consider pattern. And I, and I do know that just as you just outlined for the forest service, I mean, Cal Fire and our forest, which our, our wildfire task force is doing a lot of work and thinking about which, where, when, to what benefits, uh, et cetera, and doing just a ton of that more detailed analysis. But Adam, please. Mm -hmm. Well, then, before we go to Adam, I think, however, you can address in the climate smart land strategy, having adaptive um, reforestation approaches that more naturally help manage fire in terms of the reforestation is something that can be brought forth at a, as a generalized statement for the entire state. Yeah, but Adam, I, was say, I, think, I think that's actually what we would call a cross cutting priority or implementation is, but, but great. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, yeah, I think I misunderstood what Christy was saying to begin with. I thought you were just talking about just straight up climate induced, like mortality conversion events and restoring after that, not necessarily like still the post fire and then, okay, yeah, forest shouldn't even go there anymore, or you got to just change the forest type or something like that. So I would say, it, so the the target there is intentionally um, titled reforestation and restoration. So it's not just reforestation. It's also whatever else you need to do. Um, also in other, uh, you know, as it goes into shrublands and, and grasslands and things like that. And so, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate also like what Amanda said. When you're creating these targets, you're walking this fine line between uh, creating something that you can actually use to push action, but you don't want to be so specific that you're telling people on the ground how to do things or where to do things, things like that. We also just don't have that expertise to be able to say that everywhere across the state, you know, so, um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Um, Matt. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, my comments go back to, I was trying to raise my hand back when Mark was making his comments about um, developed lands and uh, urban forestry and urban greening. And there was some sort of question about granularity of the carbon benefits. And I think there's this continues to be, <clears throat> and it, it, you know, it's a cross cutting issue. When we don't exactly have perfect data to say where to start. But I just want to, you know, call for remembering the climate justice and the repertory mandate of AB 1757 to address the survivorship and the vulnerability of most vulnerable communities. And, and we actually have all the authorization we need, the resources agency done, uh, to, to prioritize projects that, that, that provide health protective benefits to those communities. And especially this week when I got 5,000 people in addition, Stockton, um, it's a dewatered slough. We had water stolen for agricultural profiteering. Um, they're out there. They're out there suffering in some of the worst heat events uh, in 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 our history, uh, and the you know the the, the costs of that are, are manifold. So just looking for some way to call out a, a cross cutting, um, not necessarily a mandate, but a, but a, but a, an acknowledgement that um, there are there are communities in California that have been. Uh, disinvested for a great deal of time. And that, that nobody's climate resilience comes to comes to fruition until we address these left behind communities. Uh, and, and, and 
that even if we get it wrong, even if we get it wrong in carbon calculations by investing in in, in historically disinvested communities, we'd still be doing the right thing. So the same old, you know, Adam knew what I was going to say before I came off mute. Uh, same old soapbox as usual. I think I think there needs to be a I think there needs to be an understanding that when we don't know something, we do know that we do know history. Um, and so when we talk about, you know, um, which cities are getting Mark brought up, like which 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 cities and which areas are going to get continue to get worse? Um, we know what those cities are. Those are communities of color. Hands down, guaranteed. They got the old sidewalks, they got the old infrastructure, and they have a lack of political autonomy. Um, those are the people that aren't in planning commissions, and those are the people that aren't calling down uh, state grant dollars. Uh, and so, to acknowledge, you know, the, the policies that came before all of this, and SB 535 and AB 1550, um, low-income communities of color deserve prioritization in this plan. Yeah, you know, part of uh, 1757, uh, as well as. Uh, um, yeah, doing this like vulnerable community assessment and, and quantifying the impact specifically to, to those communities versus versus everything else. And uh, even if 1757 didn't mandate it, it's still something that we would look into anyways to ensure that the actions that we're taking are not, you know, biased towards, you know, places that are, you know, have money. Uh, we want to make sure that we, you know, that these are having impacts to just like you said the people who are most overly burdened already so yep i think yeah thanks for uh highlighting that Leslie, did you want to comment yeah i just wanted to add that um matt that prioritization is reflected as one of the cross-cutting priorities across every landscape and every nature-based solution in the climate smart land strategy it's the first cross-cutting priority and then also, I just did want to draw attention to the developed lands targets and the, the urban greening ones. Um, there is a specific mention of prioritizing communities that have low tree canopy cover. Um, so the, that was built in there specifically for um, that the developed land section. Um. I don't see other committee members hands up, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions if that's all right. Um, you know, Amanda, as you started out, and this does reflect the committee's uh, recommendation was uh, acknowledging the synergy of doing restoration and so making systems and communities more resilient and finding ways to keep them that way. So that's the linkage of the short and the long term. Um, so you could think of it as the, the resilience and the conservation are linked. Uh, how are you guys thinking about doing that? Because in the end, there are there's only X Y Z amount of money. You know, we wave our magic wand, and there's a hundred billion dollars in the state of California for this activity. It's probably still not enough, but what is the thinking behind how you plan to prioritize utilization of the money to get, if you will, the, the best bang for the buck, that if you're going to invest in resilience, you want that resilience to endure. Could you share some thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, we, we do have programs, I'm going to say this, and then I fully expect to be corrected by someone sometime somewhere. Uh, but I think we we do fund the vast majority of this work. Um, and because of, or we do it ourselves as a state. So, you know, as I mentioned, we're not going to be, we're not going to be sort of taking a prioritization writ large exercise where we say everywhere in the state, we're going to prioritize these nature-based solutions in the following way. I think, you know, it really comes down to what the need is in a particular place and, you know, the value to the, to the people in that place, um, things that are, you know, not necessarily decided by or wildly and appropriately decided by the state. So, um, you know, I think our goal at this point really is to just get our, get our arms wrapped around more and more clearly what all is happening across the state. There's a lot of work underway that we don't fund that is driving on these targets. 
So um, you know, I think our focus is to understand you know, what, what those actions are and to continue to the, to the best of our budget ability to support you know, accelerating implementation from our, our end and then you know, exploring other avenues for funding. So, um, you know, whether that's private or markets or what, um, you know, we're, we're open to doing what we can to unlock more dollars, basically. Well, let me clarify. I'm not asking uh, what you're doing to unlock more dollars. Um, what I am asking is how do you plan to ensure the linkage between the short-term restoration activities and the long-term durability. Um, this is something that we spent a lot of time in the committee and the subcommittees discussing. I guess, Lori, I'm sorry, I'm not really understanding the question. Could you? Let me give you, you a couple of examples. Yeah. Um, I'll, um, you decide that somebody comes in with a proposal to do forest restoration on land that is not conserved or wetlands, mountain meadows restoration on land that is not conserved. And it seems like a great project, so you fund it. 20 years or you funded it 10 years ago. 10 years later, the owner decides, ah, I'm not interested in that anymore. I'm moving on. And that restoration work is lost. That uh, is why we spoke about restoration and durable outcomes being something that we want to see happen. They, mm -hmm. You have an agricultural field where landowner A says, I am really committed to this. I want to put in fringe plantings of native plants and shrubs, and particularly along my riparian areas because of those benefits. And then that owner has to either leave and sell or they're no longer interested in that and those benefits are lost because they mm -hmm. take them out. Mm -hmm. So what I'm asking is to try and clarify is how are you planning to ensure that linkage as you are going through, and I understand that at this time prioritization is not going to be an exact science or methodology, but how are you planning to ensure that linkage so that you do get the benefit for the long term of the actions that happen in the short term? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I think I understand better. I thank you for the sort of more example driven way of asking the question. Um, well, okay, so I think, you know, one uh, avenue that we have, at least within the resources agency, is working with sort of climate leaders across all of our departments and making sure that they're, you know, thinking about implementation of these targets as they consider grant applications for funding. Um, and, you know, again, I, I, I don't think that we're going to sort of say, well, everyone, we should um, prioritize this target over that target, but more just please consider these targets and to the fullest extent that, um, you know, we can deliver uh, implementation of them through the Your Grant Program, great. Uh, and I think just in terms of durability, you know, we are, we're driving on 30 by 30. We do have conservation targets in these nature-based solution targets, and we will be pressing for um, you know, those to be met just alongside all of the rest. And I, th I do think there's a very widespread understanding of the importance of durability. So across all of these various landscape types, we have, you know, and continued benefit is basically predicated upon continued action. Um, so I think there's a lot of understanding of that. And, you know, I guess maybe I'll just wrap by saying, I welcome your ideas for how we could do that in a comprehensive state level way. Um, I, I, I do welcome your thoughts on that. I'll also add something, <clears throat> um, you know, permanence is never something guaranteed absent some sort of like, you know, continuous payment. Um, that's just, that's why we have carbon credits. That's why we, there's like a permanence aspect to that. So in terms of like, you know, restoration projects, you know, currently most uh, applicants to restoration projects are doing it for ecological benefits, for communities, for things like that. 
as we move forward, you know, maybe if there's more money, then, you know, we have to be more, you know, thoughtful about who gets it. Um, already, I guess there are occasionally people who try to get restoration dollars for commercial benefit, but those, you know, we have a, a filtering process for, for that. So we review projects and we fund projects that have the most benefit through, you know, like committee and, you know, grant review. Um, so, but the, but the point is, you, you can never guarantee permanence. You can't guarantee permanence. We try to do that for, for carbon credits, but that's only because you continuously pay people. Um, so absent like continuous payment, you know, you can never, yeah, have that, have that. Well, okay. actually, I, I, yeah. I hate uh, to Chelsea, say it, but Chelsea I- Chelsea has something to add real quick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Go sorry, ahead, I'm Chelsea. In the background. Um, I was just gonna also add that there are mechanisms in place already with, with state-funded programs um, that, that vary by program, but that are built in to help ensure some level of durability, right? Like the Wildlife Conservation Board, you know, and some, for some of its programs requires 20, 30 year landowner agreements. And there are trade-offs to that with accessibility and things like that. But I think that there are already mechanisms in place that could be looked to, um, to better understand durability of these investments. Yeah, and I, I just think, Adam, it's extremely important to differentiate between what you're saying in terms of like a carbon project, which is ongoing payments, and conservation easements, which are a one-time payment. And uh, one has the legal status in California and the U.S. as being exempt against the laws of perpetuity, and so it is perpetual. So maybe we should just make a little distinction about those two things. Um, let me also just confirm that you are covering both public and private lands here when you look at the targets for things like 800,000 acres for fuels management. That incorporates the Forest Service's 400,000 acre target? Everything. Yeah, all, all lands included. Yeah, okay. So because of their, they have their distinct target of 400,000 and it's great to have the, the synergy around that. Um, I'd also like to go back to John uh, Calloway's uh, question on sequencing. And I'm intrigued because there's never a perfect answer to these things, but I'm intrigued in, intrigued in your thinking about um, how you look at what is a sooner than later priority for activity, um, because you always have choices to make given that Again, no matter how much money there is, there's never enough. Um, what kind of guidance are you giving to different programs of the state in terms of this window of action that we have at this point, six years from the initial 10 years of the closing window on climate activity? So how are you incorporating that in your guidance? Okay, hold on, let me make sure I'm tracking the question. How are we incorporating in our guidance to state agencies to sort of support implementation of these nature-based solution targets? How are we guiding them to prioritize? To and see sequence. I mean, some things have really noticeable short-term impact and that it'll endure. Other things are gonna have their impact later. Some things you can do now, but you can't do them later. Yeah. Um, and so how are you thinking about that? How are you guiding um, state agencies that are going to be providing the means for implementation here? Okay, well, I wanted to step back real quick and say, we are not providing the means for implementation of these targets alone. Right. Implementing these targets will take lots of funding that the state just cannot be responsible for. So I, I want to be extremely blunt about that. <laughs> um, you know, it's going to take, we're very clear that this is collective action, collective funding. Um, uh, you know, everybody's got a role to play. Um, in terms of guiding, you know, I don't, I don't know that we're necessarily, I think we're veering into the question that we talked about earlier around sort of um, uh, landscape specific expertise. So, you know, we're working with partners, you know, who are 
driving wetland restoration in the Delta, along the coasts, uh, in our forest, and each of those three places have very different sort of near-term versus long-term needs and uh, priorities. And so we're not providing any particular guidance about how to sequence, uh, you know, wetland implementation of the wetland targets just because they're, again, sort of specific to the place as opposed to, you know, the same across the board. Okay. Um, are there other committee? Oh, Classy, you put your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add one one point on there, and the, and this should be, I believe, echoed through various points in the in the targets document, definitely in the intro. Um, but you know, these the the targets were were aspatial and they were broad, and that was to really acknowledge the the fact and reflect the fact that. Implementation is local. It's got to be informed and driven by local ecological conditions, local community needs, um, infrastructure, accessibility, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, I think that's that's a balance that that we tried to strike there of creating these these meaningful um, targets and recognizing that implementation really happens at the local and, and regional scales. And so um, in, in, in some respect, it's not necessarily our um, uh, job or it may not be appropriate for us to bring the hammer down and tell people exactly what they need to do and, and prioritize, um, given that, that these are, are so um, locally specific and driven. Yeah, I think we would all agree that there's a vast distinction between guidance on prioritization and bringing a hammer down. Uh, but a lot of people appreciate guidance about just how to think about things and the knowledge about uh, where they're likely to have the most impact, whether it is direct or indirect, in CO2, in watershed services, and biodiversity. Um, there's a vast difference, and the state can probably be useful in that guidance arena, both within its own agencies and in providing that support to others where they're making their decisions. So, are there other committee questions at this juncture, or is this a good moment for a 10-minute break? I think we need to do public comment before we do a break. Okay. Um, we have Will, um, and then we'll do public comment, and then we'll do a 10-minute break or 15-minute break. Will. Uh, Will, you're on mute. No. Right, your mic's not. <laughs> we just heard you. We could just hear you when you said, no, no, no. That was Adam. Oh. It, hey, Will, this is Carrie. If you're in the building, you can run upstairs and ask your question. <laughs> Come up to my office. Well, we can hear you just a little bit. Is it possible for you to lean into the computer and the mic? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I had a question on the two-year reporting cycle. Um, if models could actually predict, uh, for example, soil carbon sequestration, that might be one thing, but there's no way to, in practice, demonstrate a significant change, uh, regardless of management, to show up in an analysis, in a, in a chemical analysis. It wouldn't occur in the, in the second, um, cycle mm -hmm. either and it might be there in the third report so i guess i'm wondering <coughs> if how the state will do that i mean because the model will likely say carbon is being sequestered but there's no way to actually validate that uh practice. yeah i think it would be good for us to repeat the question for everybody 
um, on the in the meeting. And so I'm going to take the liberty of doing that, Amanda, before you respond. Um, so Will's question was on the periodicity of reporting as required by the legislature and uh, the fact that um, from a chemical perspective, the gains or changes in, for example, carbon are unlikely to be uh, tangible and measurable before six years. Um, and so you're asking about how the state is thinking about that in terms of, of this? Is that fair? Is that what yes, you said? Exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Over to you, Amanda. Yeah, so uh, it is it is a very frequent reporting period. Um, and the first year that we're required to report is next year. So, uh, you know, I think we're, we're thinking about this in a broader way. So first of all, we're gonna be reporting on, uh, you know, progress of our implementation. So you know, what 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 have state agencies been able to deliver toward uh, supporting implementation of these targets? What have we done to be able to better track broader climate action on our lands to understand, you know, the, the level of action underway? Um, and then we will be utilizing, at least to begin with, the um, inventory that uh, CARB runs for the land sector, um, which will, you know, inform the progress report. But yeah, it's not in the in year one, it's not necessarily going to say, you know, much of anything other than this is the snapshot of where we are right now. Um, and kind of serve as a, you know, every two year kind of touch point for people to to see how are we doing. Um, but again, I think we'll we'll be using the reporting as an opportunity to talk not just about carbon, but about other benefits of these targets. Um, so there'll be more to say than than just the carbon piece. Amanda, to ask a question following on that, it would seem to me that in the very beginning when you were discussing, uh, for example, why you um, identify conservation as opposed to avoided conversion, even in the two-year time period, I, I would suspect the state is able to say, we have funded restoration of XYZ number of acres of wetlands uh, or uh, supported the transition of two or three, you know, whatever the number of farms is to organic or uh, funding has been provided for working lands conservation easements or something along those lines. Um, since the date at which the targets, which I think was the first uh, element of 1757 was issued. Is, is that fair as well, that you now, by the way you put the targets out there, you have some ways to quantify progress? Yes. The, beyond the, measuring that, carbon. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, we're also very interested to um, tap into the quantified progress that gets plugged into other places. So, for example, um, you know, we've got Eco Atlas in California where wetland restoration efforts are um, often uh, plugged in. So, you know, what can we learn from existing uh, tracking systems that help us understand sort of more of what's happening beyond what is, you know, the amount that the state itself is funding. So we'll be looking to understand uh, a the bigger picture um, more and more and more over time. <laughs> Uh, well, perhaps this is a good time to go to public comment. Um, are there any, uh, so we have Karen Maki, uh, who's raised her hand and hopefully others as well, but Karen, would, would you go ahead? Right. Um, so my, my question has to do with why there's not more focus on increasing carbon when we're doing this in order to address climate change? Um, okay, well, I'll start, but Adam's gonna pipe in too. So yeah, um, in the land sector, we can store carbon in trees and plants and soil, but if, there's, if our lands are not healthy, they release that carbon. So what we're trying to do is through these targets, we're very focused on ensuring that our lands are delivering a carbon benefit. But in order to do that, they really have to be healthy and resilient. That's how you get what we call durable carbon stores. So mm -hmm. um, 
you know, the carbon benefit is unlocked by increasing the health and resilience of our lands. But also, I would just say this, the, the law that required us to develop these targets also asked us to consider how can these nature-based solutions not, you know, of course, we want them to deliver a carbon benefit, but we also want them to deliver an adaptation or a resilience benefit. So, for example, how can we increase urban tree canopy in a way that cools communities that are most vulnerable to extreme heat? How can we think about wetland restoration um, in a uh, in a way that's going to help ensure that we're protecting coastal communities who are very vulnerable to uh, flooding, sea level rise, storm surge? How can we invest in uh, you know wildfire and forest resilience? increasing the health of our forests, but it also in a way that protects the most fire vulnerable communities. So we were asked to consider uh, that piece of the climate puzzle as well. But Adam, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just that, um, you know, when when thinking about managing lands, you can never manage lands for just one benefit. You have to think about the multiple ecosystem services that these lands provide. And uh, sometimes more carbon is dangerous or detrimental uh, to both society and the environment. So, you know, wildfire, of course, is like a very easy one to point to. Um, so, yeah, uh, not always is more carbon actually beneficial and actually to lead to real permanence or durability and sustainability of carbon stocks and sequestration, that public health and public safety piece has to be in place first, because we're not going to sacrifice public safety and public health for carbon stocks. I think the other piece to this, Karen, is that if you don't have the land, you don't have the service at all. So that's where the notion from the committee came from, as well as being reflected in the report, that we want to link the resilience with the durability. Um, and so those two things are built in there. And I think one of the lessons that we've all learned about ecosystem function is if you only focus on one aspect of it, it tends to break down the system overall. Uh, and particularly, for example, taking that forest example, we have put way too much into, way too many stems into the ground that can, then the ground can sustain. So mm -hmm. that's where so much of the fuels reduction activity comes from. So I hope that's helpful. Um, Tom was next and then Evan. Tom? Yeah, hi, this, actually this is Maya, Maya Kusla. I'm um, here with Tom Conlon. Um, I wanna appreciate that you're talking about you know, really solid things like resilience and durability, and also want us to um, know how you're moving forward with a holistic look at existing data, given that citations like Davis are being used, which actually include review papers that leave out a swath of data, multi-decade studies um, on wildfire intensity by the government, as well as by independence, by Forest Service, as well as by independence, showing that burn severity can actually be higher. These are empirical studies. They can be higher um, in really heavily managed forests. That being said, there's probably a sweet spot between like some management and too much management. And, and therefore that leads to this uh, constant discussion about fuels discussion, which is sort of like shades of gray. Um, these very same studies show that, you know, fuels reduction that targets low intensity um, and durable carbon stocks can actually be the ones where you lose a lot of the carbon and then after the fire you lose more because they, those areas are well documented to result in high severity fire. And that's what you're trying to avoid. And I, I also want to mention that the reforestation efforts that you are lauding, that uh, previous um, efforts which you're hoping will go into the future with more efforts, um, often includes clear cutting before the replanting effort and that carbon is not being counted and needs to be counted. And finally, um, I want to cite Bevlaw's study, Dr. Bevlaw, who's done studies all across three states, including California, showing that forest health projects and other extraction efforts lead to five times more 
emissions than the wildfires themselves. And that's not the only one. There's just uh, Bartowitz et al. Um, comprehensive studies and review papers um, based on empirical data. So I was just wondering, you know, how how are the checks and balances being implemented as you go forward, given a lot of these studies that are being ignored? Thank you. Yeah, in Japan. Um, so, yeah, we we regularly do uh, literature reviews on on things that when we need to. So, for example, yeah, again, you can look in the, the scoping plan and um, look at uh, we did a literature review of all the projections uh, that, you know, uh, uh, that have occurred in California uh, and the impact that that activity has in uh, yeah, I'm familiar with the the research that you're talking about, um, and uh, those are things that we are considering. And so um, that's not it's definitely not lost on us the impact of forest management. Uh, additionally, I mean we have a specific report that we put out as CARB every five years called the SB901 report, uh, which specifically um, quantifies the impact that forest management has on carbon and we also um, included in that report is also the impact of fire has. and so we're always improving our estimates of how management and fire are impacting carbon on the landscape um, and uh, it's never perfect but we're we're always trying to improve um, so uh, yeah it is something that we we do take into account um, additionally, like post fire restoration, where you have to do some level of, uh, I wouldn't call it necessarily salvage log, it doesn't have to be done. You have to typically do some level of logging uh, to make it safe for restoration. And, you know, often now it's it's trying to minimize that um, that salvage logging afterwards to, to do sort of like an island planting effect. Uh, there are other techniques, uh, I'm sure. Christy and others on the committee could, could speak more to, to the actual implementation of that. So anyway, yeah, I uh, appreciate the comments and, and uh, yep, those, those things are definitely on our mind. Yeah. Oh, thank and you. And I would simply say, um, please tune in in September where I think we're gonna have a bit more of a focus on some of those questions about the impacts of fire um, and on the landscape and how to look at that from an inventory monitoring and reporting perspective over time. So maybe something of interest for you at that at that juncture. Thank um, you very much. I'm um, just really hoping, which is such a far focus, I'm really hoping you're looking at the what ends up happening on the land in response to thinning. Thank you. Yeah, and 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 how we are estimating emissions associated with fire and how we're mapping intensities and so on. Um, Evan? Oh, thank you. I'm the engineer for the California Compost Coalition. We worked on a scoping plan um, with CARB and it had some really good metrics and targets. And that went back to a 2019 um, document that was put together by a working group. So it's a lot of good metrics, a lot of good information there. But what I don't see, it wasn't rolled over into any current targets. Um, we have SB 1383 to get organics out of the landfill. We, we're making about seven, eight million tons of compost per year now. We got another five to seven in the future. So I don't see those metrics anywhere in the newer working documents. Is there a way or a comment period where I can have submit comments again in order to um, provide those scoping plan um, metrics that are of record that we worked hard five years to um, work on? I hate to have that information lost with a new group of folks. Can I just ask you to clarify, are you saying that the nature-based solution targets don't have, uh, don't reflect some of the targets that you had put forward related to SB 1383 implementation? Correct, and as part of the scoping plan adopted, adopted by CARB last year, adopted a natural working lands targeted, how many new um, acres per year of, of irrigated cop, cropland can be used compost. So we have some really good metrics, none of that I, I see in your current working documents, but it is of record since 2019 and 2023, and I don't see it anywhere anymore. Well, currently, uh, you know, municipal waste is not necessarily within natural and working lands, you know, kind of boundaries, right? So 1383 
uh, yeah, it shares some, you know, overlap, but it's not so clear cut um, where it totally lies yet. So um, I'm talking about compost use. I'm not talking about garbage. We make organic compost certified by CDFA. So we're not talking garbage. We're talking about certified organic compost been using for decades in California that is working quite well for natural working lands. And it is included in this in the scope of the scoping plan. And it is a sink that that car put into the scoping plan for the first time in a, this is the fourth update. So it is very much within your scope. Yeah. OK, so I, I do want to just flag that uh, we do include compost application in a target um, on, for croplands. And you will, we've also um, incorporated uh, compost as a priority nature-based solution for um, other lands in the 2022 Climate Smart Land Strategy. So uh, I think I, what I'm hearing is perhaps uh, compost, you're, you're suggesting compost should have been included in more of our targets, our nature-based solutions. Yeah, the targets is already adopted by CARB, so the targets are already there in a scoping plan. And those targets about how much acres per year of compost use that would be new is not, I don't see that in any of your documents. And that's what I like to submit comments to again to make sure that gets in the record because a lot of good work was put in to get there. Um, I can jump in really quick. I just threw into the chat in the methodology section describing the targets. Uh, the cropland targets include a swath of different practices and compost application is listed in there. So we didn't call out specific individual practices in these um, cropland targets, but instead we called them healthy soils practices and included compost application as something that would be uh, applicable for this. And then I will resubmit in comment period about the acreage amount each year to get up to the needed amount to be the carbon sink of, of 15 million metric tons per year. Um, that I can resubmit. I don't see the, the metrics or the target metrics of yesteryear. So it's a great in, in, in a, to include compost, but how much is what's missing in your targets? And we've got a lot, a lot of good work's been done, and I will resubmit. Is there a comment period that I can submit by as part of today's meeting? Well, Evan, I, I would, I wanted to flag one thing, which is, um, uh, it was mentioned by someone earlier, which is at, at the at the end of the targets document, we have a set of actions that state agencies are uh, prepared to undertake to help support implementation of these targets. So these are not these do not reflect things that are happening right now. They reflect new and additional actions that state agencies are willing to take on. Some can be done with existing funding. Some require funding. But I want to point you uh, to one of those targets or uh, excuse me actions that was put forward by Calver cycle that was worked on I think in close collaboration with CDFA and CARB and others um, suggesting that uh, developing an overarching soil amendment strategy for the state uh, to estimate availability of compost and other soil amendments in support of the state's goal so I think we're aligned in that you know that quantification is an important next step and something that our agencies are quite focused on. There's not going to be another open co uh, public comment period for the targets. However, there will be an upcoming public comment period for the updated draft of our climate smart land strategy, which will be coming out in the fall. So that would be a really great place for you to um, uh, help us get it right. OK, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. I do not see any further um, public comment hands. Can anybody in the room identify if there's something that I'm missing? No, Brian Shove was here, but he had to step out. So if he had a comment, we can maybe ask him uh, during the next public comment if he wants to weigh in on this agenda item as well. OK, um, then with everybody's permission, I'm going to call for a 10-minute uh, break for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. 
Wanda, Adam, Klesi, uh, Chelsea, are we at time to begin again? Um, yes, uh, technically it's been 10 minutes. Um, um, if we could wait a couple more minutes, I think that would be good. Uh, Wanda's still not back yet. Okay. Did it really hit 112 in Sacramento today? Did it? Already? That's what I'm asking. Earlier, it was, it was going to about this time. 111 right now. 111 right now. There you go. Well, better you than me, Gunga Din. Yeah, we're, we're a full 17 degrees above the point at which they don't call it peaks. It's all right, it's right like off the tomatoes, but it's bad for the yield. Yeah, a few weeks down. Above 95 degrees. Yeah. It's the pollen can't do its thing. Oh, okay. They stop. They stop. So, yeah, so fruit, so is, have, fruit is already there. We'll continue. You have flowers right now. You might as well just trim those things off and then hope for the next time around. I, they may, I think they they pollinate earlier in the day when it's cooler. But uh, yeah. yeah, there's definitely always a always yield drop. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But then they carry. Tomatoes until December. Yeah, I know. Here we have nothing to complain about here. We have such a long tomato season. <laughs> Do you garden? Yeah. I don't think I've met. I'm Brian. Matthias. Matthias. I obsessively garden tomatoes. Ah, beautiful. I've had up to 90 plants. Ah, yes, you're one of those. All the varieties. Yeah. 90? <laughs> 90 plants? I have tomatoes. You can? I did until my wife said we're not moving with one hundred twenty jars of tomatoes. <laughs> so I'm taking my sabbatical. Wow. Yeah. You need a song going in the farmer's market. Like, I should have been like, this, this year. It's not so it's not a garden. Yeah, it's. I, I have three cherry tomato plants, and it's like I'm getting a pint today. It's like uh, I can't eat more than a pint a day of tomatoes. <laughs> I was a little late this year because I applied for a job. Got distracted. <laughs> Um, she's on her has Amanda come back in? She's not, but she's on her way. We could we could start probably. Lord, would you like to start? Amanda's on her way down. Okay, well let's wait for her to come in uh, because I think that key to part of this is um, addressing yeah. some of the questions on. Um, on barriers to implementation uh, that you all perceive and that we can be discussing further than what we identified in the plan that we, uh, not in the plan, but in the uh, recommendations and report that we've put forward. Well, then maybe we need a monitor for that. Yeah. Yeah. Are there stairs in the CNRA building or is it only elevators? I'm sure there has to be stairs. There are stairs. Leslie, have you taken the stairs all the way up to the 20th yet? Not all the way up. Only between, between floors. Well, get, you guys all have to do the 20 stair challenge. Yeah, exactly. All right, Mondo's here. <laughs> Sorry, right. guys. Okay. Well, I hope that all the committee members are back um, so we can begin again here.
And this was the portion of our conversation on uh, implementation, barriers to implementation and uh, barriers to getting solutions developed. So Amanda, in this section, you know, we had provided quite a bit of thinking the committee had uh, in our report and recommendations. So it would be helpful perhaps if you might give us guidance on what you'd like to have pointed out here. Um, recognizing that we do have um, something that is outside any of our control uh, with the budget situation in California and with the bond measure being uh, approved for the ballot in November. Money obviously is always going to be never enough, but uh, maybe you could open it up. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I think I know where Lori was going with that. So <clears throat> while she takes a sip of water, um, I'll I'll just say yes. I mean, I'll back up. The AB1757 calls on us to update the Climate Heartland Strategy. We are updating that strategy. We are releasing a draft of it this fall and expect the final to be uh, released in early uh, 2025. Um, one of the biggest, if not the biggest shift called for in this update in, in AB 1757 was the incorporation of information about barriers to implementation, and potential solutions for those barriers. Um, but the bill also calls on us to incorporate the targets themselves into the Climate Smart Land Strategy, which makes sense. Um, so, Yes, uh, we are working on this draft and um, just want to express our appreciation for the uh, number of barriers and potential solutions to those barriers that was put forward through the reports you all developed last year. Um, we have pulled substantially from those documents uh, to build out this chapter uh, in, in the 2025 uh, update. Um, we've also incorporated some of what we've heard through public comment in these committee meetings. We incorporated, uh, we look back at all of the public comment we received when we developed the first strategy. Um, and of course, we held some uh, land type specific workshops earlier this year where we got input on this issue as well. So um, I think that's just really kind of some background for all of you to know that those are the various things that are going to be informing what you all look at. Um, and I think Lori was very um, correct in her earlier teeing up of this discussion to sort of say, we provided a lot, but this is a great opportunity to either lift something up that is just a particular focus um, or to identify something that, you know, maybe wasn't in that recommendation, but is very important to um, delivering on these targets and should be considered for incorporation into that draft. Um, and then also just after having looked at the targets, if there's anything that's like, well, we didn't mention it because that wasn't what we put forward, but since this is what's in your targets, here's uh, some things you should consider. So what's really, the floor is wide open. Um, what we've done is we've grouped these barriers into sort of types. So of course, you know, funding is a barrier. Um, state agency, uh, organization and grant uh, processes have been identified uh, as a barrier or, you know, some certain elements of those um, efforts. Um, uh, you know, distinction between sort of authorities and jurisdictions can be a barrier. Um, and, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this quite correctly, but, you know, our, our Cutting the Green Tape initiative is really designed to address, um, you know, speed for permitting processes. Are there are there opportunities here for us to help, um, you know, to use that that process or maybe not that process itself, but just the idea to help accelerate implementation? So we've grouped these barriers um, uh, and, you know, I think would, would be very grateful for you know, any additional insights 
um, that we could help incorporate into our draft. Maybe, Clessie, I don't know if you want to, if I, if, sorry to put you on the spot here, but um, I don't think you need to go into all of those groupings, but just to give people kind of a flavor of what we're thinking about would, would be helpful, I think. Sure, there, there are only six, so I can just list them off. Um, funding and investment, regulations, permitting and policies, technical assistance, capacity building and education, uh, workforce and infrastructure, community outreach and involvement, and uh, data information and research. Right, so based on like all that we've heard, those are kind of the big buckets of, of barriers that we're, we're tracking. Um, and she can, you know, say that again if it's helpful. But just wanted to give you guys a breadth and sense of the scope of of what we're what we've heard and how we're thinking about it. Thank you for doing that. Um, could I ask that we take down the item three again so that people who are just um, the oh, yeah. uh, the screen share so that people can see each other a little bit better. Thank you. Um, so, and I apologize. I have heat. I'm coughing away from that. Um, are there any committee thoughts um, that anyone wants to share at this juncture or highlight out of the things? Because it, the categories do reflect um, a number of the discussions that we had and things that we highlighted, uh, particularly on our cross-cutting uh, recommendations where we were focused on um, highlighting the need to build up the workforce and provide information to communities to sustain that for the long term. That was a really strong element that we had flagged. Um, obviously, we have flagged things like funding or uh, not inclusive of, but not limited to direct grants and investments in that respect. So um, I'm going to open it to committee members to start. Do you have any thoughts here, Matt? Yeah, I, I have the privilege of sitting on a steering committee of one of the California Jobs First uh, regional initiatives. This is where the state was broken up into 16 three county regions. Uh, and they were all given a solid chunk of money and uh, for, for increasing workforce capacity for um, you know, just transition strategies and for underserved population. Well, mine has been focused on underserved populations and um, child care has become a priority for ours. But these are these are regional um, entities now that have um, that have authorization authority over certain proposals to the state. I can't remember what the the competition is called, but there's a $400 million competition coming up later in this year and um, applicants won't be won't be authorized unless they receive the endorsement of the California Jobs First regions. And so that there, there's, this is all just to highlight that there's sort of a, a moonshot accelerator strategy in the state to bring together workforce innovation hubs around the state and that those, you know, um, they're certainly interested in what we're talking about here in my region and some sort of a integration or coordination or literacy ritual might benefit us all. California uh, Jobs First used to be the SERP, the Economic Resilience Fund, but they changed it to Jobs First. Sorry, was there a question? I, I just I didn't hear what you said about integration. Just before yeah, you well, well, I think, I think each of those regions that they're looking at climate resilience and workforce direction. Um, and I think they would benefit from understanding um, these recommendations uh, as well as the, the, the climate resilience planning of natural resources agency. Um, and it's a state initiative. Uh, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be great if those dollars all pushed in the same direction. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't know if anybody else knows about the what used to be the surf. Couple. Okay, I see because it's not cool. I mean, I, I think there's an opportunity there to either make those 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 three county regional entities literate as to these 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 recommendations, um, and that those are 
those are auxiliary dollars that, are, that would be well suited to implement some of these recommendations in their respective regions. Uh, okay. Super helpful. I, I do want to flag Matt. We have an incredible colleague on our team named Rebecca Burgess, and she's been our liaison to the California Jobs First initiative, and she's been doing a lot of work with various regions to, um, you know, connect them with state resources uh, to help kind of build out any kind of nature-based solution component of their economic development plan, and, or just to even underpin their plan. Um, so totally agree with you on the nexus there and how important that is and that there's a lot more to do in that space. And so I think, please know that if, if there's any way, if you see a need or a gap, please feel free to reach out to us and we can help connect you with Rebecca and help, uh, you know, help close those gaps as, as helpful. Yes, thank you. What, what was Rebecca's last name again? Burgess, B-U-R-G-E-S-S. -S. It's the House of Burgess, got it, thank you. And so, Matt, um, is this specifically for workforce training and development? It, it has become that. It was really about regional resilience initially. And everybody that submitted a robust application was dealing with, you know, we were, we were mostly in the Central Valley and in the state suppressed regions, and we don't, we have a really real talent pipeline issues. So success in our region has been defined by escaping it for the last 50 years to the first world on the coast. Um, and so trying to find a way to keep people in our region, uh, we find that, you know, nobody wants to live somewhere that where you die early and your babies are born light and there's nothing fun to do. Um, so it was, it was about it was about addressing the basic basic quality of life survivorship in these regions. So it really became about jobs. And then I, I don't I, that's at least my understanding of the evolution of the CERF into California Jobs First. Well, one of the um, points that was brought out frequently in the in our committee discussions was. Um, you know, the nexus between, for example, high schools and community colleges and training people to go into the resource restoration and management fields um, from a climate with a climate lens. So I think that's a terrific suggestion. Thank you. Sorry, I'm being surrounded oh, by peacocks here. <laughs> Speaking in oh. office. So I'm going go off camera real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts? Mark? Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, so I'm <clears throat> I'm just wondering uh, what what we're meant to do with this list. I mean, th this list seems like a lot of uh, big buckets it's, and I'm sitting here thinking, trying to think about individual barriers that I think could uh, inhibit success. And I can't think of any that I couldn't put into one of these buckets, but there's lots of other things you can put in these buckets too. And so what these really mean, I mean, the, the, uh, the value of this is gonna be what, what is said about each of these things. I mean, so that the regulations, permitting and policies, you could be thinking about federal to the state nexus, states to counties, counties to local communities, whatever. Um, you know, so I, I'm just trying to get a little bit more on on how we can be helpful in your thinking about these big categories. So we shared the big categories mostly just to help kind of orient to the kinds of barriers that we've heard about obviously we've got a lot more specifics you know within these buckets um you know based on everything that i just laid out we've heard from people and so you know what would be most helpful as like the expert advisory committee to us is you know as i look at the targets in you know the land type that i worked on i want to really emphasize that this this barrier which either i mentioned before in my recommendation or i didn't mention it, is is really critical. We urge you to address this barrier, you know, 
quickly and immediately, it will unlock a lot of your ability to deliver on these targets. Or, you know, um, you're missing a whole category completely. Uh, so I appreciate you saying that you think the barriers kind of fit within those buckets, but maybe somebody has a whole different, you know, thing to share. So I guess that's kind of what we're looking for is like, you know, you're experts in this space. What are, what do we need to focus on here? There's a lot of barriers. <laughs> I'll just um, add one other thing. In it, it's it. Our goal, of course, is to understand the barriers, but also solutions. So, taking off, you know, your California hat, maybe just understanding, you know, things that have worked in other places that we might adapt here to California. Um, you know, we want to be thinking about solutions to the fullest extent possible, and maybe the solution is like pilot this, you know, see if it could work. Um, it's, it worked really great in Greece, but I don't know how it's gonna work in California or something like that. Um, you know, we're, we're very focused on the solution side too. Um, so Matt, I'm gonna turn first to Debbie and then come back to you and then I, I have something to, to flag. Yeah. Debbie? Yeah. Um, and also Lara, sorry. Okay, I, I agree these, buckets make a lot of sense and align i think <laughs> very well with what i've been you know hearing and, and putting together and um i guess what i'm wondering is if it would make sense for us i mean i don't know that i could like come up with some specific examples like in right now in this moment so are you looking for something like right now on this call or would it be worthwhile to have us kind of go back to our original groups and identify like one or two of the most important barriers barriers that we had previously identified along with the solution and, you know, send that to you by some certain date or just kind of wondering about like the, the timeline and format that you're looking for. Yeah. Well, I guess um, we really just wanted to create the space, particularly after, you know, diving into questions and, you know, the deep dive on the targets. We just want, we thought it'd be helpful to create the space here fresh of, and here's what we see is going to be very difficult to to tackle. Um, you know, what what's going to happen next is we're going to put this draft out, and our our request of this committee has always been, you know, please, you know, think about barriers and solution. But really, when the draft comes out, um, we'd love to have it be informed by your thoughts, and we very much like to make sure that when we shift the draft to the final, that it is informed by your thoughts. So a lot of what you've put forward already has informed the draft. And I think the most important thing will be, um, you know, your, your input at whatever point you want to provide it, it will, it will be helpful. So it doesn't need to happen on this call at all. It's just a space to, to weigh in if you have sort of a burning thought. Um, but that's, that's why we created the space today, and that's the process ahead. Uh, Matt, and then Laura. Yeah, well, I, I, after hearing Debbie speak, I definitely want to second the idea of going back to our working groups to come back with working group recommendations on barriers and priorities, so that you know, my thoughts are being vetted by somebody before they're out here. Um, but my my initial comment was going to be that. Um, you know, the, the, to, to, to address this, this posture where we don't want to tell local authorities or regions what their priorities are, that we want to give them some sort of like authentic authorship over, over how they engage with, with, uh, with, with this initiative. And that, that, that just doesn't work in my region because it, it's, it, it's not acknowledging the, the capacity gap the wealth gaps and the technical not wherewithal gaps that exist. Um, I really, I really, I really think we need to have a proactive you know, identification of vulnerable communities and a and a technical assistance, you know, um, accelerator for for most vulnerable parts of this state where we're losing human bodies, let alone you know species and 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 habitat. Um, and that, and that we can't count on regional or local governments to evolve fast enough to meet this crisis. Um, I, I've 
I wrote I wrote Urban Forestry grants in Richmond for a long time, competing against competing against Berkeley. Tried to write them in Stockton, competing against better better resource cities. And so, so so long as funding is tied to regional initiative and proposal, you know, you're in a competitive equity framework, and there's no such thing as competitive equity. Right, equity is targeted universalism. We have it. We have we have our Office of Environmental Health has its assessment map. We know who's dying earliest. And we know who's most vulnerable to climate related risk. Uh, it would be great to have funding tied to human you know, human health and and, and outcomes. Uh, but, but there's got to be a way for us to. And maybe this is, this is kind of what like what Strategic Growth Council tried to do with its transformative climate communities, and I'm sure they've learned a lot. Uh, but there's got to be a way for us to overcome the human resource barriers that that are going to continue to keep the people who need natural and working lands measures the most. They're gonna, they're just not going to participate. We're going to lose out on all the benefits of working in those communities. Um, with some sort of direct assistance and literacy campaign where frankly like there's there's environmental justice and public health advocates who are straight big league by local government their county supervisors their city council members have no have no reason to take them seriously and they dismiss us out of hand and they silence us and marginalize us and we live in a very different california than maybe the rest of us do um so some it would, it would be wonderful to have a radically inclusive component of this natural and working lands strategy um, that goes out and helps people who may not even know they need help. Yeah, Matt, that's a really thoughtful um, observation relative to, uh, it's a counterpoint to the notion of the state steps in with a heavy hand to direct people to do things. And uh, I think with, um, Classy was speaking earlier. There's a there's a there's a balance here, and there's a overriding uh, set of concerns. But uh, it's well said. So I'm sorry, Manda, you were going to say something there. Actually, Classy read my mind. I just, Matt, I just wanted to make sure that you were aware um, and engaging with the uh, governor's office of planning and research. They have they're developing what's called a vulnerable communities platform to identify the most vulnerable communities to the impact of climate change. Um, I'm not entirely sure where they are in their process, but just wanted you to be, okay, great, cool. Yeah, uh, and perfect, like, perfect place for that body of knowledge to start to be built. Laura? Um, I think <clears throat> one thing that I, have been thinking about and I it doesn't sort of show up as a barrier per se um, but one thing you know that is true of these targets is that a lot of them are area based um, and that makes sense because area is very measurable from a satellite um, and it's easy to track when you're making a grant or an award or you know because we have land ownership that is measured in acres and, and things like that. So I think that makes sense. I think, though, I wonder a bit how we'll know if the, the solutions and the targets, you know, are really achieving the climate resilience and community benefits we hope they'll achieve when we're just measuring area. Um, and so I guess um, I, this is something I'm it's I'm not sure that there's much to do about it. It's just something I wanted to flag in this discussion about, you know, um, the potential for a divergence between success in meeting targets and success in um, in actually achieving the resilience and community benefit. And um, and so I think we want to avoid this kind of divergence be, you know, coming to fruition or, you know, having this be a barrier to community, you know, to buy-in essentially, because if people aren't seeing the benefit, even though the targets are being met, then, then you end up with, you know, 
So anyway, I like I say, this it's a little bit of a theoretical concern, I think. Um, and there is, I realize, like this revisiting process, you know, where the targets will be revisited. But there's something about, um, yeah, maybe strengthening the the over time, trying to strengthen what we measure to be the actual benefits we seek, and and not just the area on which activities are happening. So. Yes. Yeah, so that that will be part of our um, monitoring and reporting that we'll be doing. So uh, I was trying to make the point earlier. Yeah, that um, yeah we're going to be tracking and quantifying. Yes, the carbon benefits or impacts, I should say, of of all these actions, but then also the co-benefit um, impact of these actions as we can, as time progresses and, you know, science improves and our ability to measure and monitor things improves. Um, yeah, so again, hopefully, yeah, that's part of our objective is to, to better quantify the benefits of all of these actions uh, so that we can show society essentially and everybody that, you know, makes the decisions on where money goes that, uh, yeah, these actions are uh, impactful and actually the return on investment is much greater than the cost. So, uh, yes, for sure. Yeah, and I think this gets at um, maybe what Christy was saying earlier about the stories that we tell. Like, I think over time it would be nice to have the stories be about those things and not about the, you know, where we are on tracking the acres per year. Yeah, I. I will just say that I think <clears throat> I mentioned earlier too, like, well, our, our reporting is gonna, you know, involve sort of multiple components. We'll probably address a lot of different things in the reporting. It won't just be like the carbon snapshot from the inventory. Um, but in line with your your points about, you know, telling the story, I, you know, we we I very much understand that this is a sector for climate action that there is a lot of people who, who just don't understand, like, how does that work? I mean, I worked on climate policy for my whole career and I I have learned a lot in this job about how, how the land sector contributes to our climate goals. And so, you know, to me, it seems like really critical that that, you know, literacy campaign, I think is the phrase that Matt used, but just public awareness, helping people understand like what, what exactly is it about this sector that delivers on climate benefits? What are the other benefits? Because I mean, from where I sit, you know, our tent is huge. There's a lot of people who will benefit from these, uh, these actions. And so we did uh, request funding in 2022 for, um, what we call like nature-based solution improvements, you know, partnerships and improvements. And we are using some of those funds to build out a, a public awareness campaign. And what I'm hearing from you all is, you know, an interest in making sure that that gets connected with our reporting on progress, which I actually hadn't connected those dots in my mind before. So I appreciate this because what we're thinking about is really kind of doing some profiles of, of projects that have delivered uh, you know, multiple benefits and, and you know, really letting the, the people who have led those projects and who are benefiting from those projects be the one to tell us about what that meant and uh, what it delivered. So this is all very good fodder for kind of thinking about what goes into that reporting. Perhaps some of these deep dives where we tell some really powerful stories is a good <clears throat> um, element to that report. Thank you. And I think perhaps um, developing an internal matrix of those co-benefits that you can illustrate that with, um, because much as we all like our words to be meaningful, often infographics are the at-a-glance benefit. So if we're talking about um, cooler cities, well, there's an infographic that can illustrate that. If we're talking about additional species benefited, there's an infographic that can, you know, that, that can be incorporated. But um, since, since from the very beginning, the focus of this has been this uh, integration of both metrically, what we'll call theoretically objectively metric oriented uh, assessment, um, numbers that you can track, you can monitor, you can report on, uh, 
that's the, the, the classic carbon uh, metric or the acres metric. And then there are the uh, process and people metrics, which are much harder to convey um, that are the ones we were just been, we've talked about a, a good bit in terms of quality of life um, and um, overall resilience of communities, both urban or built and natural uh, with that. So I have a quick question for you in terms of your relative, um, your comment on barriers and one of the things that we know about uh, money, which is money can impact things directly and indirectly. Um, so there's always this question of, we want more money, for example, in the bond for direct grants, but there are other ways to leverage uh, public money, whether it is through loans or it is through tax credits or it is through tradable uh, instruments within that, that can end up leading to a much greater impact on the ground. And uh, so that's something that um, we spoke about in several of the land types. And uh, think that that's an area where we can make the dollars go farther, uh, potentially through having a mix of instruments as opposed to simply relying on direct grants. Lori, I'm taking a note on this, but was there a question for me or just like this is a barrier you need? It's important to consider the right mix for these landscape types. Um, it's both and. Uh, to me, since funding is always a barrier uh, and people tend to think of funding as I need a dollar, uh, the idea of no to low interest loans for that dollar of forgivable grants for that dollar, of tax credits for that dollar, of tradable tax credits for that dollar. Those are all different ways to leverage that dollar. Uh, we know from Colorado that tradable tax credits leverage about 13 times what a direct dollar will do, but you still have to have that dollar. Um, so what is the mix that you're looking at? Uh, so the question is, um, on the one hand, it's, a, it's just a statement that I think we need to look creatively at the dollar. Uh, that we're seeking. Um, and on the other, um, this does become a question at a certain point of prioritization. How does the state want to use its dollars? Um, and uh, having a strong mark, does, I don't know if that frown was for me or if that was uh, for something else, uh, but you can tell I'm paying attention. <laughs> but um, kinds of things that our recommendations help you consider the mix of ways that you would allocate that, you know, internally within agencies, you say, well, maybe we want to incorporate another tool here. So it's both a statement and a question. Okay, I think I see what you're saying is, I got the statement, but I think the question is, how are you thinking about stretching public investment through sort of atypical Currently atypical, maybe, um, right. you know, methods. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a lot of these more ideas, creative financing of that. Yeah. A lot of these ideas actually came, did come forward when we were developing the first strategy. So we're pulling from a lot of what we heard in the development of that strategy for consideration. Um, I think, you know, this this is a barrier. Currently, it's the longest section <laughs> uh, as we've been drafting this. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity there, Lori. I don't disagree with you. Um, I guess to the extent you've you've identified tradable tax credits as one, um, you've identified uh, um, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm blanking there's, out. There's low interest and no interest I, loans. There's I, forgivable right, right. loans. Yeah. Right. All of so I, I can give. I mean, yeah. We've been work. I think we've been working with Department of Finance with the um, iBank Infrastructure Bank um, mm -hmm. and with GoBiz in uh, developing 
the updated version of this climate smart land strategy. They contributed to the first round and we're going to be you know, working with them to, to contribute to the second. So um, it's, it's helpful for me to hear you kind of emphasize that and I can kind of carry that forward and mention that it came up in, on this call and here are some of the specific things that were raised. Are there other committee uh, comments or suggestions in this section before we move to um, public comment? Uh, then let's move to public comment on this section. Are there any thoughts from members of the public attending the meeting? Uh, I think this is Maya. Uh, hi, this is Tom this time, actually. Oh, it's and, Tom this time. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going to get it wrong every time. No, no, for, for, forgive us. Uh, but I, I did type my question into the chat, and I was just curious, not having looked over the document yet myself in any detail, if the um, if you're if we're thinking about the lack of protocols for measurement and verification, if that's a barrier that we need to overcome before we have the quantitative rigor to support all of this new investment that we all want to see? Or is that the outcome of the process? I'm, I'm maybe a little confused, but it seems to me that as, a, as an institutional platform, we really need to have protocols. We need science informed protocols and then the protocols need to be uh, implemented and, and care and fed over time and there needs to be buy-in to them and all of that as we saw in the program uh, energy efficiency program space that was so successfully been able to transform that world so that's my question I'm curious if there's any thought about that as a barrier yeah so <clears throat> i think that's like a level of detail like below where we're talking about we're talking about yeah, like if we're talking about market based mechanisms like voluntary carbon credits or, um, you know, uh, other types of carbon credits that may be out there, um, you know, that that's sort of the level that we're at um, instead of, uh, you know, really thinking about like the specific protocols within there. Um, it could be that like a certain landscape type doesn't have a, a market. And so it could that that's that's sufficient. And then it's like, okay, well, we need to develop a, a protocol uh, for that. If it's the case where a market could actually be used, and there there's lots of cases where we've developed protocols for certain uh, land types, and then they're just never used. So it's actually the market-based mechanism is not really the the barrier. It was a perceived barrier, but it wasn't real because we created that market and then it never materialized. But uh, that is to say, um, yeah, if there are certain landscape types where there are not market-based mechanisms where we can enable uh, private funding, yeah, like let's think about that. I would also like to see or hear about some like novel market-based mechanisms that we could start to employ beyond even just like the voluntary carbon market. Um, we can create whatever markets we want, right? So, I mean, let's think outside the box here and like uh, figure out how we can mobilize some money in this space. Other comments from the public? Okay. Um, and I suggest we move to the next item on the agenda. Chelsea, are you personing the agenda, the slides? Just, for, just, yeah. there. just a minute, sorry. There we go. Okay. Right. Um, straightforwardly, our next meeting in September, um, we have just in terms of our um, topics that have people teed up to uh, present at them, we believe we have uh, folks for our remote sensing conversation and also for discussion on some of the issues associated with forests um, to build off of what Mark had said earlier uh, within 
the committee's recommendations, the two areas that had the most tangible um, increases in carbon sequestration associated with climate resilient management and conservation action uh, were forests and urban systems. Um, and those two, the remote sensing and forests are currently flagged for uh, the September discussion, as well as um, the possibility of the draft of the climate smart land strategy being available then, although that is very early in the, in the fall. Um, actual season uh, in that respect. So I don't know if the state can confirm or deny, uh, or if we'll, we'll be back in the UN where I used to work and saying we can neither confirm nor deny that that draft strategy would be available um, in advance of the September, September 12th meeting, or if it would be presented at the September 12th, September 12th meeting, or if that will be the focus and core focus of the November meeting, which is my guess. Um, so those are the two that we have scheduled. And um, Debbie and Matt, uh, I greatly appreciate your thinking about the subgroups, but I'm also very appreciative of people's schedules and the summer. And I think it is unlikely um, that there are likely to be gatherings of the work, the informal ad hoc working group uh, by land type that we had assembled for last year. Um, but I would suggest that we, um, if within your, informal ad hoc working groups uh, by land type, you want to highlight a particular thought and forward that or several thoughts on the uh, barrier and implementation issues that we all identified and surfaced at that time, that's terrific. And we can convey that to the state. Um, are there any thoughts, comments, suggestions relative to the September and November future meetings? Laurie, I just um, had a question about um, whether the forest focus is um, primarily a modeling focus or if it's broader than that. I'm, um, I, at one point we had discussed doing something about the modeling piece and I just I wasn't quite sure what what was encompassed and if I am uh, on the hook for or something in particular. <laughs> we, 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 can, we can address this offline. Okay. Um, I think it's a, I, I think it's a both hand. So okay. let's, let's take this offline. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Lori, I'll just pipe in to say, I think I can quite safely say we will not have the draft out by September 12th. Yeah. That's helpful for planning. Uh -huh. Okay, well, you're gonna step out of diplomatic protocol then, but I, I, I think that's very good for clarity. Um, so we will be looking for that to come out at some point in October, if you want our input in November. What's, yeah, what's the think thinking that, there? Because yeah. uh, I think that's a safe assumption. I mean, I, I'll never commit to something because it's a little bit out of my control. <laughs> um, we've got a plan and then things happen um, where things flip. So uh, I'd say that's very safe, but again, just want to to reiterate, I think that the ultimate product um, of sort of feedback and other things, you don't need, you do not need to use your last meeting to um, convey that. If you all decide that's how you want to use the time, wonderful. If you decide you prefer to just provide it in writing, wonderful. Like whatever you think is best. Well, um, we can we can understand more of that, but my understanding is the committee disbands after November six. So you can help us um, see how we uh, what that what what would be what that future holds. But um, that's certainly oh, our I, last meeting of the year. Yes, I'm sorry, Lori. What I was trying to say is it doesn't have to, the the provision of recommendations, um, or feedback, comments, etc can be provided in writing, not necessarily tied to a meeting is what I'm saying. So if you decide Understood. you don't, yeah. Understood. Um, I'm just recognizing people's re relative time commitments um, and engagement around that, but super. Um, any further thoughts before we give people an hour back in their very hot day? Public comment for this item. We should probably open it up.
Right. Well, with the assumption that the silence in this case is that there is not any public comment, uh, we'll bring this meeting to a close and thank everybody for making time to do this. And I appreciate all your work uh, on the state level, Amanda and Adam and Plessy and Chelsea and all the team behind you and appreciate you making time to do that speed date with the um, with the uh, targets uh, in the beginning of the meeting as I think it did help focus everybody and bring everybody up to the same level. So thank you. With thank that, you take care. Bye. Bye everyone, thank you.